All right, it looks like it's slowing down on the attendees coming in. So I'm just gonna get started with the welcome. There might be a few more trickling in. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you for everyone who is with us today, both presenters, audience, um, and I'd also like to thank the Azrieli Foundation who has funded the project that allowed us to organize this event series for you. My name is Ellen Belshaw. I'm the Education Outreach Librarian at the Jewish Public Library and Archive here in Montreal. Myself and my colleague, Izel Carter, the Digital Outreach Librarian, will be facilitating this session for you today. After my brief introduction, I will be turning over the mic to our four amazing presenters today who will each present for about 15 minutes. At the end of all four presentations, we will have a question period. So uh, this is a Zoom webinar, which is a little bit different from a Zoom meeting. So all you may have noticed that all audience members are muted and cameras are turned off upon entry. If you have any questions for the presenters in either English or French, there's a Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. If you have any technical questions, you can also put those into the Q&A and Izel will, will answer those privately. Um, or you can email events at jplmontreal.org. You're welcome to add questions into the Q&A section at any time during today's uh, session, but we'll be posting, or sorry, we'll be posing them at the end of the Q&A to the panelists. Because of this, uh, if you'd like to add the name of the presenter or the institution that you're directing your question to, feel free. Some of them may be more broad and might incite some good discussion amongst several participants. Um, the presenters, the presentations today will be recorded. So uh, if anyone has a question that they definitely don't want their name attached to, uh, please indicate anonymous in the Q&A feature. We've also created the Archives Roadshow 2022 hashtag for this event series. So it's hashtag Archives Roadshow 2022. Um, and we encourage everyone to use it if they're sharing their experiences on social media. Please stick around until the end for a bit more information on the upcoming second and third parts about this series. Before we dive into presentations, I would like to share the Jewish Public Library's land acknowledgement. The Jewish Public Library is situated on the traditional territory of the Gunning Tohaga people. The land is also a meeting place for many indigenous nations. This land has been the site of exchange, creativity, and storytelling for thousands of years. We are grateful to be able to cultivate lifelong learning, imagination, dialogue, and creativity here. The order of presentations today will be carried out in the same order that they were listed in promotional material for the event. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Sarah Jan. Sarah Jan completed her master's degree at the University of Toronto's Toronto Centers sorry, Toronto's Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies with the Collaborative Program in Jewish Studies before working as a curator for the Montreal Holocaust Museum. Supported by the Open Oxford Cambridge and the Cambridge Trust, she recently started her PhD in history at the University of Cambridge while pursuing her work at the MHM as a history and conservation consultant. She is also involved in other projects, such as the documentary Apareku on children of the Holocaust and the Rwandan genocide. And that's... Turn it over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Alan. And thank you, um, colleagues of the Jewish Public Library for organizing such an outstanding series. Um, I am pleased and honored to present an objects and the Montreal Holocaust Collections on behalf of the museum today. Uh, but before starting, the MHM also wishes to emphasize that the Montreal Holocaust Museum is situated on the traditional territory of the Ganyangaga people, a nation recognized as the custodian of the land uh, and water around us. Um, and with respect for ties to the past, present and future, we recognize the ongoing relationships between indigenous people and people of the Chojage Montreal community. As a Holocaust Museum, our mission is to inform and educate people about the Holocaust and other genocides, along with its ongoing consequences. This land recognition acts as a small expression of the museum's solidarity with Canada's Indigenous peoples, hoping to promote the working through process of affected survivors and communities and support the quest for justice, equality, and recognition. Next slide, please. So to start, I would like to delve into the Montreal Holocaust Museum history. Uh, the MHM was founded in 1979 by Holocaust survivors who emigrated to Canada after World War II and uh, for the most part settled in Montreal. 
the approximately uh, 13,500 objects and the 858 testimonies in the collection of the museum come mostly from these survivors and their families and bear witness to the life and diversity of Jewish communities before, during, and after the Holocaust with letters, photographs, household items, clothing, and religious objects from around Europe and North Africa. Next slide. Um, thank you. In response to the invitation from the Jewish Public Library, we ask ourselves what kind of objects will best capture some overarching themes from our collection. Um, I must admit that choosing an object from our collection is always a tremendously difficult task, uh, not only due to the number of objects we have, but also due to the sensitivity of our collection. And so while we firmly believe that these objects represent key component of our collection teams, such as the pre-war life of communities and individuals that were persecuted by the Nazis and their collaborators, world reactions to the Nazi regime and its occupation of Europe, and resistance, rescue, and life and hiding of victims, we also wish to emphasize that several other objects could have satisfied this requirement and or that we could have decided to follow other teams in our field and collection. With that in mind, it is my pleasure today to share Gustav Bauer's personal history during the war through a particular object, a suitcase. Next slide, please. So this wooden suitcase has a golden lock and a letter handled. As you can see, also the initial of Gustav Bauer are painted on the top. Uh, the suitcase was made by Gustav between 1940 and 1941, when he was detained in an internment camp in Canada. The suitcase is currently not in our current exhibition, but is being used for educational purposes and activities with students. I believe it is representative of our collections because of the object in itself, as well as um, its story and the fact that we can also delve into Canada's history during the war. Suitcase can also be important in metaphorical, uh, metaphorical objects illustrating the Holocaust. In some instances, suitcases have become powerful symbol for representing the period. So, for instance, if we think about Anna's suitcase or Irene Nimirovsky's suitcase, which contain her posthumous work, which some of you may know or have read, uh, Suite Française. But beside her symbolic meaning, suitcases are also of historical importance. Jews round up in France during the Holocaust, for instance, were frequently encouraged to pack a suitcase, presumably to deceive them into believing they were heading for internment or labor camps and not death camp. When considering Holocaust representation and objects, we can see that suitcases have had the capacity to illustrate not only displacement, but also the memories it carries. And it is within this context that I hope to share further Gustav Bauer's story today. Next slide. Thank you. So Gustav Bauer was a Jew born in Hamburg, Germany in 1924. In 1935, while Gustav was on vac uh, vacation with his brother Werner Bauer and his mother Anne Bauer in Fano, Denmark, the Nuremberg laws were adopted. At that time, Gustav's father, Manfred Bauer, was able to help some of the wealthier Jewish families to smuggle their own money out of Germany by bribing ship's captains and other crew members. However, Manfred was eventually caught and arrested. Learning about her husband's arrest, Anne decided to extend her stay and went with her son to see her sisters in Brussels, Belgium. In Belgium, the boy were sent to public school and during that time, Anne rented a small apartment with a large dining room and started cooking dinners for refugee men who were with other families and required kosher food, thus providing a much needed service while gaining financial independence. After two years in prison, Manfred was released and returned to the Jewish community in Hamburg, where he was able to settle his affairs before being reunited with his family. Upon Manfred's arrival in Brussels, the family moved to a larger apartment and Manfred found employment under the table while Anne continued to work. Meanwhile, Gustav pursued his studies and unlike his older brother who pursued academic studies, he opted for trade school, which his father advocated. He was taught at the École de Ministerie et Ebenisterie, where he completed two years of the three years course before the war interrupted his studies. Indeed, the German invasion of Belgium in May 1940 has seen things up when German authorities began calling all Germans male before, born before January 1st, 1924, which meant that Manfred and Werner had to report themselves. They were held and sent to southern France in Saint-Cyprien, and when Gustave and Anna tried to join Manfred and Werner in France, they were quickly identified as Germans and immediately arrested and sent to Great Britain. 
they were actually put aboard to, uh, abo aboard to the last boat to leave Austin before the German marched in and took over. As internee uh, boarded the ship, men and women were separated. Gustav, then 16 years old, could not stay with his mother due to his age. After staying several days in Pentonville, the men were moved to Kempton Park Racetrack, where they were joined by other young Jews of German origin. From there, they were sent to the Isle of Man and resorts to accommodate the prisoners. But we must understand that most of these resorts were totally unprepared to receive their assigned load of internees. Most of them, these places lacked sufficient washing and toilet facilities for the number of prisoners assigned. Food was scarce in wartime England, and the prisoners were underfed. Gustav remembers being hungry much of the time and decided to volunteer to help clear the tables so he could eat what some of the older guys might have left over. After about two months, the prisoners moved again. England thought it was advisable to keep Germans far from the country. Indeed, anxieties over military losses, the imminent threat of a German invasion, and the insecurity of the realm in conjunction with the press, politicians, and government officials had transformed German refugees into what was called the fifth columnist. So German-born residents were mostly believed to be enemy alien, regardless of whether they were Jewish refugees, anti-Nazi refugees, self-profess Nazis, or long-term residents of German origin. Therefore, Sylvan internees were sent along with prisoners of war in Canada, but also in Australia and New Zealand. Gustav Doth left the, um, with the MS Sobieski on July 4, 1940, and crossed the Atlantic to reach trois -Rivières. However, among the internees aboard, aboard were also Nazis who harassed the Jewish boys. These incidents should and could have been avoided, but the sailors were unaware that they had two drastically distinct groups until they boarded. After all, Britain only mentioned sending, and I quote, the most dangerous enemy aliens, end of quote, including among those Nazi leaders, Italian fascists, German ex-combatant, and what was called category A internees, uh, which was supposedly the most dangerous category, although the categorization process was quite arbitrary. And so by July 15, 1940, Canada had received from Great Britain a total of 7,653 deportees, and most of them were actually civil entities. The ignorance was also amongst the guards. So following Canada's agreement with Britain, guards were unaware that they had been assigned to guard civil entities and not capture soldiers. According to Gustave, once in Trois-Rivières, it took the guards approximately three days to realize that they had two different kinds of prisoners and that the prisoners of war were terrorizing Jews. Next slide, please. So as a result of the treatment, the two groups were eventually separated. After a few weeks, the men who were um, not prisoners of war left Camp T and Trois-Rivières for Camp B in New Brunswick, a camp that was not yet ready to receive them. The reality is that Ottawa was generally surprised and quite unprepared to cope with the unexpected and unwanted British request. And so showers were not yet installed. There was only one water tap reserved for plumbing. And to add to the difficult conditions, the guards were changed every three months so they wouldn't fraternize with the internees. To Gustav's notebook, Camp in the Camp, uh, we can see that Gustav quickly became a leader of his work crew in the woods. Not only was he a fast learner and was trained, which made him well suited to forestry work, but Gustav also took an active part in the planning and building of a sukkah, big enough to seat about 100 men, which also meant that materials in the camp gradually began to disappear. Um, and so the men called it organisieren. So what they did actually was to steal wood, nails, and build themselves whatever they fancy, such as furniture and suitcases. So it is believed that Gustav made the, the suitcase during that time. The suitcase is therefore not only telling for representing his personal story, but it also allowed us to see a glimpse of Canada home history and responses regarding the Holocaust. In 1941, for instance, the Canadian authorities decided to move the Jewish camp inmates uh, to Olonois, an island in the Richelieu River near Saint-Jean. From there, the men could be released under several different programs, and so whether inmates were accepted to study, work on farm, or participate in the war industry, they all needed an acceptable sponsor who uh, would make sure that they obeyed the law. So some Jewish men in the camp were luckier than others um, because they had relatives or acquaintances who were ready to take such responsibility. 
Uh, Kurt Rothschild was one of them. And as he took his leave, he promised Gustav that he would find a suitable sponsor for him because Gustav knew no one in Canada at that time. And Kurt kept his promise. So in 1942, at the age of 18 years old, Gustav was released and sponsored by a man called Joel Sternhall, who lived in Ber on Bernard Avenue in Outremont. There, Gustav was fed, clothed, sheltered, and sent to school at Stratcona Academy, uh, the neighboring high school, providing a much different life than what he, had, uh, he was used to in Canada. Next slide, please. So from leaving his country to being deported to another as an enemy alien and being interned, Gustav's suitcase made during his internment in Canada can both highlight the trouble and difficult journey he had endured as a German Jew during the Holocaust and be seen as a form of resistance. Because after all, Gustav had to steal those materials to create these objects while interned or the suitcase help build. So we believe to um, we decided actually to choose this object since it can recall Gustav's story in Europe as well as in Canada. It can show Nazi Germany's actions as well as Britain and Canada's reaction. Gustav's suitcase also offer a glimpse at his family story. So throughout his internment in Canada, Gustav was able to correspond with his father for a time, and with his mother and his brother until Werner and Anne arrive in Canada some time after the war was over. Unfortunately, his father Manfred did not survive. So after being arrested with his eldest son, Manfred was deported from the Rancy to Maidane in 1943, um, where he was killed. Um, so the suitcase displayed memories and experiences carried throughout the war. We believe in the importance of presenting this object since the suitcase has the power to allow uh, a glimpse into survivors and victims' stories, recall multiple countries' responses, and emphasize one individual path as well as seeking its agency, uh, making it an important object in a collection. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sadajan. That was awesome. So our next presenter is Catherine Biggs Craft from the St. John Jewish Historical Museum. So I'll briefly introduce Catherine and then pass it over to her. Uh, Catherine Biggscraft holds a bachelor's and master of art degrees in history from the University of New Brunswick. She joined the St. John Jewish Historical Museum when it opened in 1986 and became its curator in 1998 on the retirement of the museum founder, Marsha Coven. Over the past 34 years, Catherine has created many museum exhibits, developed online ex exhibits, organized extensive archival collections, greeted thousands of museum visitors, organized events and educational programs, supervised dozens of summer students and generally managed to keep the Jewish Museum operational. The St. John Jewish Historical Museum plays a key role in preserving and sharing the Jewish history of St. John. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. I'm hoping I get through this because my computer is being very uncooperative today. So if I suddenly freeze or disappear, please bear with me. <laughs> um, so. The as Ellen mentioned, I picked one artifact from our collection, and this was the brass samovar owned by the Friedman family. And if you could move to the next slide, please. As I've begun doing with all of my online presentations, um, this presentation is dedicated to the memory of museum founder and its first curator, Marcia Coven who said, our mandate is to collect and to conserve and to display and to educate. I think that is very important because education eliminates discrimination. Um, I would also like to add, and I missed a little bit at the beginning of this, but because the lands from which I'm presenting are somewhat removed from those in Montreal, I did want to include a land acknowledgement um, not part of one of the slides, but I would like to note that the St. John Jewish Historical Museum is located on the traditional territory of the Wallistic Way or Maliseet people, whose ancestors, along with the Mi'kmaq and the Pashko Tumakati or Passamaquoddy tribes, signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. And these treaties protected their rights to the lands and resources. Next slide, please. 
Oh, that's me. I think Ellen already read that. So I guess we can move to the next slide after that. Um, I'll just speak very briefly about the St. John Jewish Historical Museum, which was established in 1986. And the museum tells the story of the Jewish community in St. John from its first known Jewish resident in 1783 through successive waves of immigration to the present day, including a wave that came from England, cigar makers, the Eastern European immigrants who arrived beginning in 1892 through the 1920s, a smaller group of Holocaust survivors, post-war refugees, including one or two individuals who had come from Camp B, um, the camp that was referenced by Sarah Jane in the previous presentation, and more, rec more recently, immigration from Israel. So the museum does present those patterns of immigration as well as exploring Jewish traditions and customs. And we also put together a series of changing exhibits that recall the richness of family, business, and organizational life that flourished during the golden years in this community in the 19, from the 1920s to the 1960s. Tours of the museum are led by members of the Jewish community and by volunteers, and each of whom give visitors a unique first person view of local history and cultural experience. The museum is open to the public um, from May until the end of October, early November. And um, yeah, um, next slide, please. So this is what you came to see, the brass samovar um, from two different angles, just to give you a sense of it. And this samovar has been on exhibit in the St. John Jewish Historical Museum pretty much since we opened in 1986. It was brought to St. John by Mary Friedman in 1905. And later it passed from Mary Friedman to her daughter, Anne, her husband, Harry Holtzman, and daughter, Myra Holtzman Freeman, have graciously allowed the samovar to remain in our collection. And the samovar dates from probably before 1899. And the photograph shows it in its place in the immigration exhibit. Next slide, please. So who were the Freedmans? Well, I'm taking a lot of the words of my presentation from the story that Marsha Coven wrote for our immigration exhibit in 2008. And she started with her grandfather and said, my grandfather, Abraham Friedman, whom we called Zeta, arrived in St. John before the turn of the 20th century. When his ship docked at Long Wharf, he noticed that a friend from his home village of Durbion was working on the dock as a longshoreman. The friend must have convinced my grandfather to stay in St. John because this became his home for over 50 years. And this portrait of Abraham Friedman and the other pictures that and family photographs that follow are all from our collections. Next slide, please. So Abraham and Mary Friedman, who you see here, and Marcia continues the story. Zeta left his wife and child, Yehuda, who was later called Jack, and who ultimately became my father, that is Marcia's father, behind and door beyond. It took Zeta five years to save enough money to send for his wife and child. The, woman, the women in the village told my grandmother that her husband would never send for her because many men, after arriving in the new world, did not want their Brina Cozina because they discovered that now they could see women wearing powder and paint and going to dance halls. So I guess they thought things were pretty fast over here. However, true to his word, my grandfather sent for his wife and child and the family grew and prospered. Next slide, please. This is a photograph of the Friedman family from the 1930s. And Marcia goes on to say the family grew to have doctors, dentists, lawyers, business people, editors, marketing people, financial planners, teachers, and every occupation imaginable. We even had a lieutenant governor in our family. So the image that you see here in the um, very French is Abraham's grandson, Bernard Friedman, who I think was listed on there as 
um, became an insurance agent. The boy leaning against his grandfather Abraham is Lou Friedman, who became a doctor and was in family practice well beyond the age of most people with expected retirement. Then Abraham and Mary Friedman, their daughter-in-law, Rose Friedman, their oldest child, Jack, and leaning next to Jack is Marcia Coven as a young girl. And in the row behind are Jack's siblings, uh, Ben, Anne, and at the moment, I can't think of the name of the other one, but perhaps somebody who's watching may be able to help fill that in later. Um, next slide, please. So Abraham Friedman um, started as a peddler like many of them did, and then he went on to establish his own business. And he founded the Eastern Iron and Metal Company, which was later renamed A. Friedman and Sons in 1918. The business itself was located on Long Wharf, not far from where he had landed 19 years before. And his brother, Ben, and his son, Jack, worked at A. Friedman and Sons. And this was a scrap metal company, so collecting and shipping scrap metal. Um, you can see from the size of the building that clearly they were probably doing quite well. And in a protected part of the harbor, so easily enough to bring um, metal in, ship metal out. And Jack Friedman, as he stepped into the role in this business, became a past president and board chairman for the Canadian Secondary Materials Association and provided advice to the government on conducting salvage during the Second World War. And all sorts of scrap metal that have been collected within the city, everything from soup cans to tin foil. And ultimately, this material was gathered, processed into ammunition, guns, other war material to carry out the efforts during the Second World War. And the scrap metal business continued in operation until the 1970s and stayed in that location. And the image that you see here is the one image not from our collection, but is from the collection of heritage resources in St. John. And this is one of thousands upon thousands of photographs in that collection. Next slide, please. The newspapers in St. John of the Day um, are filled with advertisements for Jewish organizations, Jewish businesses, lots of stories on Jewish events. And I was able to turn up these two advertisements for A. Friedman and Sons, both from the Evening Times Globe newspaper, which um, published in St. John from the mid 1920s until about 2000 when it was rebranded. Um, the um, advertisement for the Jewish Holy Days dates from September the 13th, 1958. The image at the bottom is from the wartime, so March the 3rd, 1942. So scrap metal wanted to make tanks, guns, and ammunition. And there are four businesses listed on this advertisement, A. Friedman and Sons, um, British Iron and Met Metal, Deitcher Brothers, and Dominion uh, Metal Company. And all of these businesses were run by Jewish men in St. John. So they all were working together collectively to ensure that they were doing their part. Um, next slide, please. So this is another photograph of the Friedman family, but this time from 1986, um, a little more contemporary than the other photographs you've seen. And this is the family gathered together in November, 1986 for a family wedding uh, for Sherry Coven, who was the youngest daughter of Marcia Coven and grandchild of Jack Coven and great grandchild of Abraham. And this image includes, um, at least uh, there are three generations of the family shown here. Next slide, please. All of those people that I've talked about um, lived out their lives in St. John and are buried in the Sherazetic Cemetery. This cemetery was established in 1873 
and is the resting place of more than 950 former uh, St. John residents. And the grounds are still in use today. I've chosen three stones to show you. Um, first of these belonging to Abraham Friedman, who was born September 22nd, 1872, died April 2nd, 1944. And the inscription on his stone reads, beloved husband and father, born at Scood, Lithuania. Mary Friedman, the stone in the center, um, her inscription reads, beloved wife and mother, born Dorbian, Lithuania, and her dates being September 15, 1875 to August the 2nd, 1948. And their son, Jack, uh, born in 1899, died September 5th, 1963 and buried her with his wife, Rose Friedman, who outlived him by, I think about 25 years or so. Next slide, please. So I wanted to finish out with Marcia's words. And she said, now the reason I tell this story is this. Last year, as I mentioned, she was writing this in 2008. My husband and I sold our home and moved to a condominium next to Long Wharf, where my grandfather landed. The cruise ships now docked there. My grandfather did not arrive on a cruise ship. He arrived without language or luggage or money. And here we are on the same wharf, living in what we feel is the lap of luxury. Life certainly plays strange tricks. I wonder what my grandfather would think of all this. And the photograph here, uh, Marcia Coven with her husband, Jerry, and taken in the family store. And Jerry Coven's family had arrived in St. John um, in the, about 1930 and established a family clothing store, Fairville department store on the west side of the city. By the time the store had closed, about 1994, the store had long since morphed into a store for working men. So working clothes, work shoes, given its proximity to three or four large city factories. Um, and it was a very traditional store, so it still had a tin ceiling. It was kind of, you had to know where it was in order to find it. So certainly not a store that people would expect to see today in that same style. Um, next slide, please. So if you'd like to know more about the story, this story or others that we have at the museum, I've got our address there. Um, we're a little off the beaten path for some of the tourists, but well worth the walk to the top of the hill. And as I tell all of our visitors, particularly those that come on the cruise ships, that it's all downhill back to the ship. Um, we also have a website, a Facebook page, and an Instagram page. I probably give most of my attention to the Facebook page. Um, so if you want to see other things that I post through the week, that's probably the place to go. And I think that's probably my last slide, Ellen. I can't remember. I believe so. Yep. Perfect. Thank you, Catherine. That was wonderful. Thank you. So our next presenter is Christine Barris, and I'll let her introduce herself. Welcome, Christine. Great, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. I, uh, sorry, I just have to pull up my own presentation here. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I um, personally am located in Ottawa on the unceded and surrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here reaches back to time in memorial. I recognize the Algonquins as the customary keepers and defenders of the Ottawa River watershed and its tributaries. I honor their long history of welcoming many nations to this beautiful territory and uphold and uplift the voice and values of our host nation. Uh, and now I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, myself. I've um, been working at Library and Archives Canada for almost 21 years now. So a little while, I've been working um, in the multicultural portfolio, which the which contains the our Jewish collection um, since I guess about eight years now. So uh, so a little while. Um, so uh, next 
blah. Well, I guess I could introduce the <laughs> what I'm actually talking about. So um, the archives doesn't really have objects the same way museums do. Um, and especially in the area I work in, we, we certainly don't. So um, I, I, I chose a collection instead and the collection is the Lion Cohen collection. But before I uh, talk about that, I'll just tell you a little bit about Library and Archives Canada um, because it might be, uh, a lot of people maybe don't know why we're here. <laughs> um, so LAC has been around for a really long time where the, uh, we collect Canadian publications and we are the archival repository for the government of Canada. But in addition, um, we also acquire archival materials from non-governmental organizations and individuals in Canada who are of national significance. So that's where my area um, comes in. And in terms of the area, it really didn't start till the 70s. Um, and the, so they used to call it the Ethnic Archives. Um, it started as a five-year program that they thought by the end of five years, we would have all the multicultural material in Canada and we could shut that program down. Obviously that didn't happen. Um, but in the meantime, we had kind of gone around and, and sort of like a, a, like a fishing trawler sort of scooped everything up <laughs> that we could. And so not only did we kind of earn not the greatest reputation, but um, we ended up with a lot of stuff that uh, in general that doesn't really meet our criteria. So that's always a bit of a challenge. Um, right now we have over 500 meters of records relating to Jewish communities in Canada. So close to 200 collections. Um, some are really, really tiny. Uh, some are just partial collections and I, like the remainder, the big part went uh, often to the Ontario Jewish archives or the Canadian Jewish archives. Um, but within our multicultural collection, um, the Jewish collection itself is our largest um, collection. Uh, and you may have heard of the Jacob Lowy collection as well, and I don't deal with that. That's, it's published, so it's old and rare, Hebraic and Judaica. Um, if you're interested, I can, you can contact me. I'll, my info's at the end, and I can give you more information on that. So um, very little of our collection is digitized. And so it's, it's makes it a challenge to get uh, our information out there, unfortunately. Um, and just a little bit about these uh, images I've got here. The first one on the left is an acrostic that uh, Lyon Cohen did. Uh, it's Rachel Lyon. Uh, and he was young enough, I don't think he'd met his wife yet, who was Rachel. Um, so it may have been a cousin that he was writing about, I'm not quite sure. Um, the second, the middle, item is a brief evaluation of him from the McGill Normal School uh, in Montreal. And then the last one is a diary entry from 1926 talking um, about Hirsch Wolofsky, who's the publisher and editor of the first daily um, Yiddish newspaper in Canada, the Daily Eagle. So uh, next slide, please. So just a little description of the material uh, within the Lion Cohen collection. It's a very small collection, um, eight centimeters of textual material and 11 photographs. Um, his son, Horace, donated the material to us in 1976, along with his own collection. Um, so the photos are not great. They're not, there's very few of uh, Lion Cohen. Um, but what's really interesting is we have a lot of writings from him from when he was quite young to um, like the early 1930s-ish. Um, he really was quite the writer uh, and his diaries cover 1923 to 30, but mostly 24 to 27. Um, and then there's a few other personal things like programs from banquets and letters from, oh, there's a letter from Mackenzie Kane, newspaper clippings, that kind of thing. Um, it's sort of interesting that he kept all this because the material, like it's eight centimeters of textual material and a good chunk of that um, is poems, plays and diaries. So um, it's, it's really interesting that that's what he chose to, to preserve. So uh, next slide, please. So a lot of people, they don't know 
that we have anything at Library and Archives Canada um, or not, that we don't have very much um, Jewish material. I think over time, we haven't been very good at promoting our collections. Um, other collections overshadow. Uh, so people don't really know that it exists. However, since I kind of took over the area, um, I've been trying to change that. And one of the ways is like participating in this kind of uh, event. And uh, it seems to be working. We, we're sort of a bit more included all the time. So hopefully with these kind of things, people will uh, come to us more and, and recognize us as a, a place to come for, for this kind of thing. Um, the other thing is we, uh, we are still acquiring, obviously still acquiring stuff. Um, we have the LAC Foundation, which is a nonprofit that supports our mandate and we do uh, get money from them from time to time um, to buy things at auction. Um, I do try that but uh, rarely succeed. Unfortunately we are usually outbid. Uh, next slide. So this is just um, one of the poems that that he wrote um, called My Mother <laughs> and he would have been uh, you know young when when he did this. Um, and this would be his writing on the, the left. Uh, in his collection, there's a number of poems, um, but I thought this one was quite, quite sweet. Um, you know, just a nice uh, ode to his mother. Um, and sort of funny when it, it, near the beginning, it, it, she cured his left lung. I, I don't know if he had pneumonia or just a cold or something, but um, he, he, he uh, thought it important to to mention that. So um, it's always, you know, like a Lion and uh, Lion Cohen, he was, you know, like, a, I probably forgot to say that early on, but uh, a really well known businessman, community leader. And it's always interesting to see this other side of people, this sort of more personal side. Um, and I know he was quite young when he did this, but still, um, I, you know, I'm sure he carried those feelings with him. So um, next slide. So that's just another example of the kind of thing that we find in this collection. Um, it's a Purim play that he wrote when he was in school. And it's um, the story of Esther, basically. Um, and the play was actually performed um, like to parents and stuff, and it had its own little program, which I didn't include here. Uh, he played the King of Persia, I believe, in, in the play. So these are just the first two pages, but there's there's more. And uh, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's neat that he wrote he wrote that. So uh, next slide. So here uh, I've got a few slides of the diaries and those are sort of the things that I really like to focus on uh, most uh, in general in a lot of other collections. Uh, they're my favorite kind of record. I, for me, I find them really interesting, um, but they're also, I think, generally appealing to people in general. Uh, we all like to know what people are thinking. It's, uh, I like to be a bit nosy. And, um, but it's nice because normally a lot of the time you don't need to understand the context around the creation to really be able to um, enjoy reading somebody's diary. Um, so, you know, having access to their personal thoughts really helps to fill out um, our idea of who this person was, gives it extra depth, more layers. Um, in diaries, you know, they tell the stories um, from the perspective of the individual. So, you know, you might know about a, a big event, but then you've got this personal experience, which might make you think of something in a completely different light. Um, so um, like there's a few things around diaries that can be kind of problematic, but like, how do you know that someone's actually telling the truth? Not that they're deliberately lying, but our experiences are our own experiences and um, they might not always be um, factual necessarily. So that, that's something we have to keep in mind. Um, and something else that is sort of interesting to think about is um, what we can learn about somebody by questioning their motivation for writing in the first place. So in this case, I do believe these diaries were handwritten by him first and then typed up by his secretary. Um, so 
he clearly had an awareness that what he was doing was be important enough to preserve and make legible. That's a, <laughs> that's an important thing. And I've seen this in other collections, um, specifically with women's archives. They make sure that things are typed out so they're easy to read. And it, I think it's something we would more commonly see in groups of individuals whose stories have maybe not made it into the more general narrative. So there might be something to that. Um, these particular entries, this is around February 1924 um, and deals with the Jewish school question um, in Montreal uh, and sort of looks at his efforts here um, to try and uh, bring everybody together uh, for a single delegation to represent Jewish community at the provincial legislature uh, around the Protestant Education Bill in 1924. Uh, next slide. So here, another set of entries from 1925, June 1925. Um, it just shows uh, examples of his leadership within the community um, in that, you know, you've got a lot of people coming to him for advice or for help. Um, he's attending meetings where he's playing a leadership role. And, uh, and I find really interesting um, near the, so on the second page uh, around this publication, La Croix, um, which was very much an anti-Semitic publication, but um, he's saying like, let's not even acknowledge it and they'll, you know, they'll go away. Um, and uh, it's funny, this particular paper was described by uh, David Rome as a gutter periodical. So uh, that was interesting. And he also describes a fishing trip he went on um, where he illegally fished. So um, good for him. And here, <coughs> of February 1926. And at this point, um, he was really focusing on lobbying government officials, uh, federal government officials, to increase um, the number of immigration permits granted to Jewish refugees. Um, it's really telling about his status within society, both, you know, Montreal and then provincial and federal, that he could easily meet with senior cabinet ministers and the prime minister to try and convince them to grant immigration permits. Um, in other uh, entries, we see the same thing. He continually is going back and forth uh, to Ottawa to try and convince them to grant more. And, and over the, the years, as representative for a variety of organizations, he was able to secure permits for many Jewish refugees. Um, and I, a little funny thing, at the, in the first entry there, he, he has to stay overnight in Ottawa, and he's upset because it's, he's going to miss his 35th wedding anniversary. Uh, and he says, and I just have to put this down, uh, thereby disappointing my wife and family. So uh, always a family man to, to the end. Um, and so I think that's that's it for me. Next slide, though, and you'll see um, I've got some contact information there. If you have any questions about our collections or you want to do some research, um, please feel free to to contact me. Um, and I'm always happy to to chat about any of our collections. So thank you. Great, thank you, Christine. So our last presentation today will be from Veronica de la Foresta, who is our reference archivist here at the JPL Archives. She's a recent graduate of McGill University's School of Information Studies and holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from Concordia University, as well as a Master's of Jewish Studies from the University of Oxford. Welcome, Veronica. Uh, thanks for that, Ellen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I just want to start off by saying how wonderful this has been as someone who was involved in the early stages of, of, um, of this whole event, it's really nice to see it kind of come together in the end. So uh, thanks to everyone who presented as a final panelist. Um, I hope to kind of live up to those uh, previous presentations. Um, okay, so my presentation today will focus on the life and work of musician, composer, and conductor Maurice Sprigger. Uh, next slide, please. To kick things off, I'll give a brief overview of our institutional archives and uh, my role at the JPL. So since 1914, the Jewish Public Library Archives have a mandate of collecting, preserving, and making available original documents, photographs, and recordings 
that reflect the social, economic, and cultural realities of the Montreal Jewish community. Our holdings include over 500 meters of records like photographs, manuscripts, correspondences, uh, audiovisual material, and more that date back to the late 19th century. Um, I myself have been fortunate enough to be involved with the JPL as of January of this year, but like Ellen said, have worked as the reference archivist um, since August, so relatively new to the team. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the item I chose for today's presentation. It's a photograph of Maurice Brigger conducting an orchestra for one of his many live performances in what is suspected to be La Fontaine Park in Montreal somewhere around the 1950s. Um, this image is part of a much larger collection of various materials that we received in, uh, I believe, the summer of 2021. They were donated to us by a music historian and a heritage consultant here in Montreal who discovered them by chance in Extremist, uh, purchased them, uh, recognizing their value, having been familiar with Isbrigger as a conductor and a uh, composer, and donated them to us shortly thereafter. Uh, this bigger phone consists of family photographs, postcards, concert programs, sheet music, and original vinyls that, when taken together, paint a, quite a vibrant picture of this kind of vital and boisterous personality who became quite a compelling figure in the Montreal music scene of his time. Uh, next slide, please. So Maurice Brigger was a violinist, a composer, and a conductor born in a tightly knit Jewish community in Kamenetskodolsky, Ukraine in 1896. Um, as with many prolific musicians, Brigger's love of music manifested very early on in his childhood. Uh, he remembers quite fondly going crazy with joy, his words, listening to the village fiddlers playing at parties and weddings, uh, aping their every movement, imagining himself making the music alongside them. He was apparently a naturally gifted child, uh, said by his instructors to have been blessed with perfect pitch and an uncanny ability to sight read and remember melodies. Uh, he graduated from the famous Leningrad Conservatory and remained in Russia until the start of the revolution, which forced him to flee to Europe, where he lived for years as a roving violinist performing in various cafes and bars across France, Germany, and uh, Austria. He eventually moved to Montreal in 1924 uh, with his young wife and childhood sweetheart Mary, uh, herself an accomplished pianist. Uh, next slide, please. So in typical Sprigger fashion, he kind of got to Montreal and uh, really hit the ground running. According to records, within three days of his arrival, he was already playing with theater orchestras for silent films at the Palace and the Capitol Theater here in Montreal. Uh, within the year, he founded the Tremor Quartet. And a few years after that, he put together a musical ensemble called Sprigger and his Gypsies that performed for over 40 years um, on CKAC radio which is a local or which was a local French broadcasting station, uh, as well as the CBC. He would eventually join the Montreal Orchestra as a violinist for a number of seasons starting in 1931 and later would become a musician for the RCA Victor recording studio here in Montreal. He was an incredibly prolific composer who wrote about 250 songs over 40 marches and eight overtures over the course of his career. He was particularly keen on composing for famous individuals. For instance, Coronation Prelude was written in honor of Queen Elizabeth's coronation and is one of uh, four of his works officially accepted by the queen during her lifetime. Uh, Little Bells Are Twinkling was written for famous German soprano Erna Sack, captured here next to Brigger uh, in the photograph uh, at the CKAC. Um, and I also to happen, I also happened to come across uh, some sheet music that Brigger had dedicated personally to David Rome, um, a major figure in the history of both the Canadian Jewish archives and uh, the Jewish Public Library alike, uh, which is an interesting point of contact between Sprigger and Jewish cultural institutions here in Montreal. Animated by this passion for music, by the 60s, uh, he'd become a real fixture on the Montreal cultural scene, conducting free open air concerts, performing at band shells, at the Montreal Expo in 1967, putting together and financing whole musical programs out of his own pocket, uh, really for the sheer pleasure of sharing his passion with uh, friends and the public. Indeed, he was known to be incredibly generous, uh, paying for rental halls and musicians himself, and fre frequently giving away tickets to whoever was interested. Perhaps the fact about Sprigger that people tend to find the most interesting, uh, and I thought to be quite surprising, uh, is the means by which he was able to finance such lofty musical endeavors. 
Um, so while he was an accomplished musician, he was also a businessman, specifically the owner of Schwartz's, Montreal's famous Hebrew deli, uh, having taken it over from its founder and his longtime friend, Ruben Schwartz, after his passing. And it was thanks to the revenue generated from his restaurant that Sberger was able to finance years of musical production. Considering himself a musician first and foremost, he made it a point, however, to never broadcast his involvement in Schwartz's, but he was known to celebrate there regularly after performances, kind of like a, a VIP uh, guest. So closing the restaurant early and reveling with his other guests, treating them to free drink and food until the early hours of the morning. Um, so I really came to find over the course of my research that Sberger was a man who kind of embodied what we know of as the Montreal joie de vivre. Next slide, please. So this bigger font is a very natural addition to our archives that are already quite rich in musical subject matter. Uh, notable mentions include our Ethel Stark collection, who is a famous Jewish conductor for the Montreal Symphony Orchestra, um, our Alice Posner collections, our Sarah Fisher collections, and our Sam Gesser collections, just to name a few. Uh, alongside these font, we also have an extensive array of sheet music belonging to our special collections. That being said, uh, the phone itself is quite singular by virtue of Sbrigger's uh, idiosyncratic musical style. So he had developed a very distinct Roma style that was rooted in Eastern European folklore. Um, he was a self-proclaimed king of gypsy music. He referred to himself as the gypsy fiddler. He performed with his gypsy ensemble and was credited with popularizing the gypsy musical style with Canadian audiences. So this aspect alone is um, quite notable and sets Sbrigger apart uh, in the city's musical history, but also really distinguishes this collection within the broader context of our archival holdings. And it's also uh, important to mention that it's a phone that touches on so many aspects of the city of different Montreal landmarks uh, and notable Jewish institutions. Next slide. So going back to our original image, uh, this photograph was selected not only because I thought it was kind of quite a striking image, formally speaking, but also because it succeeds in capturing two uh, notable elements. So firstly, and perhaps most obviously, uh, Springer as this kind of magnetic and industrious personality uh, that he was within Montreal's cultural space. And secondly, uh, I find it captures the longstanding relationship that Montrealers have with music and festivals and performances in the park, especially. Uh, it strikes me as a real snapshot, both literally and figuratively, of the city and speaks to, in my eyes, the indelible imprint that Montreal made on Springer and vice versa. Ultimately, uh, Springer was a very proud a man and very proud of his accomplishments. And uh, he was of the mind that a musician is not really a musician until he is known. And my thinking is that preserving this film and presenting on this collection is a way of honoring his wishes and his legacy. Next slide. Um, so that's it. If you're interested in learning more about Sprigger or other collections in our archives, please get in touch with me. My contact information is obviously on the screen. Otherwise, uh, feel free to pop in if you happen to be in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Wow, that was a wonderful series of presentations. Um, thank you all for being here and for uh, putting in the time to, to um, work on these for us today.